everyone who is joining us uh, near and far. My name is Larry Goldman. I am the executive director of the Washington Theological Consortium. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the five sponsors for this inaugural Interfaith Leadership Forum. We trust there will be future events if this event is uh, well received. And uh, I want to thank the Rumi Forum for uh, coming up with the, the concept and approaching us at the consortium. I want to thank the Interfaith Council of Metropolitan Washington, the DC Mayor's Office for Religious Affairs, and the Montgomery County Faith Advisory uh, Community, uh, or is it committee, Casey? Yes. Um, and want to thank these five sponsors for putting together this event today. The uh, one or a quick couple of quick reminders before we get going. Um, our speakers will all be muted except for uh, the presenter until we reach the small group breakouts and then people will be unmuted and have a chance to engage in their small groups. I want to remind you of the rules of engagement which we sent out to everyone in the participant folder. These are basic rules of respect, like listening well, speaking once, and allowing others to speak uh, in your small groups, um, speaking for yourself in your own experience, um, things like that. Also, um, when we get to the uh, <clears throat> the, set, the actual presentations and the panelists, uh, you will be invited to submit questions via the chat feature. And the chat feature should be located down at your Zoom, um, at the bottom of your Zoom box. And just uh, chat it to everyone. Um, that's the best way to send in a question. Uh, and we'll welcome those questions and have time to uh, field them as well. When we do reach the small groups, uh, you have been pre-assigned to a small group based upon your uh, preferences. And uh, we will try to make sure everybody gets in the appropriate uh, group at the time. And we'll have instructions from our Zoom host, Kubra Unver, uh, at the time of how to, how to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Kubra. Um, I now want to introduce our, um, our catalyst speaker, our keynote speaker. Um, Dr. Beverly Goines is uh, the assistant pastor at the uh, National um, City Christian Church. Um, the, uh, she's a Disciples of Christ pastor. Uh, she has a uh, graduate, well, she's Master of Divinity from Howard University School of Divinity and a uh, doctorate from the Catholic University of America. She currently serves as an adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown University and is also the associate director of the Disciples of Christ Center for Public Witness. Uh, Dr. Goins, I invite you to um, take over the podium. Thank you so much, Larry, for your um, introduction. I'm so honored to be the catalyst speaker for this inaugural conference of the Interfaith Leadership Forum. My thanks are extended to Dr. Walkenberg and the planning committee who invited me to be a part of this forum as well as the sponsors for this event. When I think of the theme from interfaith encounter to engagement, it reminds me of my own journey, both academically and personally, uh, that has brought me to this very day. My academic research is on ecumenism in black churches, which focuses on overcoming divisions within Christianity through dialogue and Christians working together for common cause. I examined the ethical and theological approaches to ecumenism by black and white Christians. Likewise, interfaith efforts seek to recognize and overcome divisions, sometimes ethical and sometimes theological, so that people of different religions can develop relationships and work together. I taught Jewish Christian relations at the Catholic University of America, which for me highlighted the complexities that can exist when representatives from just two religions attempt to engage in dialogue. You see, when considering only Christians and Jews, there are thousands of years of overlapping and diverging history and theology to consider. There are thousands of years of misunderstanding and mistrust and persecution to overcome. Within each of these religions, you have schisms, 
So there are various branches within each religion with different theological interpretations. And there are adherents to these religions that span the world over, which speaks to the ethnic and cultural and racial and political and socioeconomic differences in the lived experiences of these believers. Yet in our colloquial usage and understanding of religious affiliation, the uniqueness, the enormous swath of religious expression and nuances of experience and expansive histories are boiled down to the terms Jew or Christian or Muslim. And our misunderstanding of each other is often influenced by what we're taught in our families and even by what we learn in our religious schools, um, our Sunday schools and Hebrew schools as children. And we bring all of these things into spaces like this, where we are sincerely seeking to gain firsthand knowledge of each other's religious expression, even while maybe being aware of our own biases and having fear of the unknown fears about the other in interfaith encounter. Yet still we come. We come into this interfaith dialogue space in the midst of a COVID-19 pandemic, a contentious presidential election amidst racial injustice. And we do so with an openness that seeks to understand how our individual faith in combination with other faiths can make our society more just and more loving and more welcoming. We also come recognizing that we must do more, to more than tolerate each other if we are to truly share social and political and economic, uh, if we, I'm sorry, if we are to truly share the social and political and economic public square in a religiously plural society. I hope that your sentiment is the same as mine, that we must work together to end that which denies the full humanity and value of any person. For Christians, helping others highlights the interaction between faith and work. And this is the thing about um, being in an interfaith uh, space. Um, you have to forgive me as I make, it, make mistakes and even come to understandings in front of you. But for Christians, helping others highlights the, inf the interaction between faith and work. For Muslims, Zakat or charity is one of the five pillars of faith, but there is also Rama or mercy that must be shown to others. And for Judaism, Tukhan Alam are acts of kindness performed to repair the world. And there's also Tzaka in Judaism, which is the obligation to do what is right and just. What I am hoping to show is that there are religious tenets or practices across traditions, though expressed differently that inform a common ground. And then this gets to my next point, which is personal experience. I've always been curious about religions, but I had a sincere desire not only to know people who are different from me ethnically or culturally, racially, religiously, but to actually develop friendships. I didn't want a homogenous professional, personal or religious experience. The problem was that I didn't know how to start the encounter. For some of you today, this is your start. I began by attending public events like the Freedom Seder at Washington Hebrew Congregation, which highlighted similarities in the struggle for justice between blacks and Jews and other minorities. I attended Suhoor and Iftar Mill sponsored by the Rumi Forum to learn about Muslim religious traditions. And these led to opportunities to participate in interfaith events that called attention to modern genocides and public health concerns. And slowly but surely, I also started making some friends. And so here we are, all of us somewhere on the continuum between encounter and engagement seeking to know each other and wanting to work together. And I believe that the Interfaith Leadership Forum can help on both accords. The objectives of the Interfaith Leadership Forum are to equip one another with models of dialogue 
to help us experience deeper levels of interfaith encounter and dialogue, to strengthen literacy of the other's faith and one's own, to overcome prejudices and misconceptions about others' faith, and to elicit social action through interfaith engagement. Today, we will do things by having some conversations that are not always easy. We will talk about tackling religious prejudice and living faithfully in a racialized society, how to learn from our differences and how to understand the life cycle of dialogue. So get ready. We're going to peel back assumptions and uncover misunderstandings. We're gonna recognize and let go of prejudices. We're gonna to begin to trust and learn how to talk to each other in meaningful and productive ways. In our breakout section, sessions, you will generate ideas and acknowledge, acknowledge challenges and hopefully develop action items so that we can move forward together. What I want you to understand is that even though ecumenical and interfaith relations have been around for a while, when viewed in light of the history of religious affiliations, we gathered in this conference are still at the cusp of something new. For there's much more, um, sometimes more hatred and violence among religions expressed than there is understanding and love and care. As one of the theologians that I studied, Courtright Davis suggested, our responses to religious difference should not be considered a burden. Rather, they should be considered a divine opportunity, an alliance in interfaith pursuits that further understanding and the ministry of reconciliation. Interfaith pursuits and our responses to work for justice helps us to see that God created a diverse humanity and that it is good. From encounter to engagement, blessings to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goins, for that challenge and for part of the narrative of your own uh, growth in interfaith work. I now want to turn to our panelists. Uh, I want to introduce uh, each one um, as uh, that person comes to uh, share in their uh, brief presentation. And these panelists, just as a reminder, will also uh, lead the breakout workshops uh, later in our um, event today. So I want to um, first introduce um, Dr. Ori Z. Soltis. Uh, Dr. Soltis is a professor at the Center for Jewish Civilization and the Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And uh, the bios, just as a reminder, are in your participant packet that was sent out and see them for more detail. Uh, just a, a note that uh, Dr. Soltis uh, speaks and teaches a multitude of languages, and uh, he has written um, and edited 19 books, and uh, I take it a few articles, and we're delighted uh, to have Dr. Soltis uh, lead off our panel presentation. Thank you very much. I am unmuted, yes? Good. So, uh, Prejudice is kind of where my starting point is, and I would like to offer brief comments in five segments, appropriate enough, since there are five books of the Torah and five wounds in Christ's body and five pillars of Islam, so five is a good number. Beginning one with the word prejudice itself, of course, which means to prejudge. It means to judge something or someone before you know anything about that thing or that individual which begets the question, not only what does it mean to judge, but what does it mean to know? Which leads me to my second element, which is to recount an exercise back years ago when I ran a small Jewish museum that I had my director of education going out into all the DC public and private schools into seventh and eighth grades, uh, an exercise in which the classes would participate. So she divided them into four parts, African-American, Asian-American, um, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, European-American. Mm -hmm. And the class it was supposed to come up each in its own group with features 
that identified each of these four categories of individuals. Now, the classes, of course, were made up of diverse people, but it wasn't that the African Americans were defining the African American attributes and the European Americans the European uh, attributes. On the contrary, it was switched all around. And then she'd have them all meet together and sort of lay out all the attributes. And the amazing thing, of course, but not so amazing, was as each group's supposed attributes was laid out on the board, members of that group would say, well, wait, wait a second, we're not like that. But then they would also realize what we thought about those other groups, maybe they're not like what we thought. So it was an opening up of their thinking about what you think you know, as opposed to what you know about groups other than yourselves. Issue three, in my experience over the years teaching Problem of God, courses on Jewish, Christian, Muslim symbols of art or Jewish, Christian, Muslim mysticism, all kinds of interfaith stuff. One of the things I've also encountered very frequently, of course, is not just that we don't know about others in terms of their religious traditions, but we don't know what we think we know about our own. Because how many Christians realized that the Christian Bible wasn't canonized till the end of the fourth century, three and a half years and more after the crucifixion? How many Jews still say at Passover, the Jews in Egypt, when it was the Israelites and the Israelites and the Jews are not the same thing. Every tradition has evolved over the centuries. And the way, as Beverly pointed out, we often learn about it, not only from our parents and our teachers in our Sunday schools, in our religious schools, is based on a constant reshaping of principles which may not have been there at the beginning and that have evolved over time. So we think it's always been this way. It turns out it wasn't always that way. And it turns out we know less about our own traditions than we thought and not only about other people's traditions. Point four then. So when I'm thinking about not only inter-ethnic and interracial and intergender, but interfaith dialogue, I need to be aware of the limits of what I know both about myself and therefore, of course, what I know about others. And therefore, if I wish to engage in dialogue, it needs to be about gathering information. It needs about trying to understand. It's not about trying to promote or make a point about my own faith. It's about trying to hear about others. We have two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we speak. It's also more fundamentally recognizing the fact that religion is by definition about a reality beyond ourselves, God, gods, divinity, whatever term or terms you wish to use. We need to recognize that if we start with the presumption of a revealed text, for example, most of the history of every religion is focused on interpreting those texts. And in fact, the beginning point can be interpreting what texts should be interpreted. So Jews and Christians interpret the Hebrew Bible differently, but Jews and Christians interpret differently whether or not the New Testament is part of the Bible. And Orthodox and Catholics versus Protestants disagree about intertestamental texts. And Ethiopian Christians accept a book of Enoch, which is not accepted in other traditions. So Bible is not a mono term. It's a multi term. And needless to say, what Jews and Christians feel about the Bible is not identical to what Muslims think about the Bible. And what Muslims think about the Quran is not what Jews and Christians think about the Quran. So even before we've started to interpret the texts, we're interpreting regarding what constitutes the text. And that's fine. We just have to understand that our perspective is not derived from the kind of knowledge we believe we have in the here and now. It's dealing with another reality that we can't know the same way we think we know this reality. This doesn't deny the legitimacy of faith. It just means to understand its limits. And five, therefore, one must also keep in mind always that while my form of faith is absolutely 100% perfect for me, it may not be for you, for you but yours may be perfect for you and not for me. In this season of the autumn, there are a zillion leaves, no two are alike. In this era of climate change, we may not see snow again in Washington, DC, but if we do, we'll remember, there are more than a zillion different types of snowflakes, no two alike. Wouldn't it be odd if the God that these traditions understand made all of that, including ourselves who are so diverse, that that God insisted there's only one path to that God? These are things we need to think about. Thanks a lot.
So welcome. Been trying to unmute myself here. Um, uh, Dr. Soltis, thank you uh, very much. Uh, our second uh, panelist uh, would like to introduce is uh, Anne uh, Delory. Now, Anne uh, works in program uh, development and um, many other things at the Interfaith Council of Metropolitan Washington. Um, Anne has done prior work with uh, the Sojourners Magazine um, and um, she has done work with um, the, um, the Ecumenical um, Agency, Church Women United. So now uh, I will turn over the podium to uh, Anne Deloria. Thank you, Larry. Um, I am going to share my screen with you. So just give me a moment. So how do we engage in interfaith dialogue on difficult topics like race and racism? It's a question I've been pondering for three years since I was part of a cohort of residents in Arlington, Virginia, engaged in a year long challenging racism program. Talking about race is hard enough. And when you layer onto it religious identity, it becomes far more complicated. In recent dialogues I've been part of, the intersection of race and faith has uncovered such issues as how to navigate the dual identity of being part of an oppressed religious minority, Jewish, for example. And at the same time, being a member of the advantaged white dominant culture. For some who hold such dual identities, it can be challenging to face both privilege and victimization. In the past in the US, many religious institutions, largely Christian at the time, served to Americanize immigrants and perpetuate Anglo conformity. And while these institutions have become more progressive over the past 50 years, communal forms of religiosity haven't actually evolved much since the 1960s, when Martin Luther King Jr. identified churches as hosting every week the most segregated, the most segregated hour in the nation. The public research, the Public Religion Research Institute recently released a study that found that white Christian groups, including mainline Protestant and Catholics, consistently hold views that are at odds with those of African American Protestants. The attitudes of non-religious white Americans, conversely, tend to be more in line with those of African Americans. For white Americans, the data suggests that their Christian identity limits their ability to see structural injustice. The, the study though limited to Christian identity is notable in that non-religious white Americans are more likely to understand the problem of structural racism. And yet religion certainly has the potential to spur on social change and foster true racial integration, as has been the case with historic African-American churches and their leadership in the civil rights movement, along with their white, Jewish and Christian allies. At the core of our world's religions is the belief in the equal worth and dignity of all people. Given this context, how do people of faith reckon with this moment in history when greater awareness of racial inequity and injustice is upon us? How do we live faithfully in a racialized society? These are the big questions that frame interfaith dialogue on race. 
And a path into such a dialogue is the widely shared sacred mandate to love our neighbor as ourselves. In the context, of course, of our racially and economically segregated society. I am a white female of Irish and Italian Catholic descent whose great grandparents fled their home countries in the late 1800s due to poverty and famine. They arrived in a place that once belonged to the Cayuga people. My ancestors rose to the level of middle class, not just because of their persistence and hard work, but because of their whiteness. My family's whiteness meant that eventually we could meld into the dominant culture and have access to opportunities like well-funded public schools, college grants, and housing loans. It meant we weren't relegated to undesirable locations with substandard public services. As a child, I lived in an almost entirely white middle-class suburb of Boston. I went to public schools in the age of busing. So occasionally there was uh, an African-American or Asian student in one of my classes. I understood that people of color were generally worse off than I was, and they were often invisible. But I didn't have to think too much about racial identity, except when I learned about past slavery and the so-called successful fight for civil rights. What I learned about the treatment of native peoples was extremely sanitized. As a progressive minded young adult, I strove to love my neighbor as myself, but who was my neighbor? Taking it literally, my neighbor was white and more or less inhabited the same cultural reality as, as I did. When as a young adult, I moved to a primarily African-American neighborhood in DC, I lived for the first time among neighbors who were living a reality quite different from my own. And while friendly, I more or less kept to myself so as not to intrude on their space, which was my understanding of what it meant to be neighborly. When I saw neighbors on their front porches gathered in large noisy groups at all times of the day and often heard gunshots or sirens late at night, I was susceptible to believing common myths about black culture promoting laziness and being prone to drug abuse and violence. Looking back now, I realize how, how mistaken I was. At this stage of my life, I seek more and more to learn about those whose stories have been left out of our white mainstream culture. It's not just about hearing personal stories either, but learning more about the policies and practices that were intentionally enacted to create and sustain our segregated, unequal and racialized society. In doing so, I understand better what role I have in creating a just and equitable life, especially in light of my Quaker belief that there is that of God in everyone. I've learned that to love my neighbor means to know my own racialized story and that of others. It means exploring books, movies, and spaces dominated by racial ethnic others and listening and taking seriously their lived experiences. We individuals and communities of faith have the potential to offer moral leadership in building an anti-racist society by examining the impact of white supremacy on all of our lives with the goal of loving our neighbors in the ways they deserve to be loved and to act on that love. The potential for living faithfully in our racialized society is right here in front of us. Yet we continue to fall woefully short of living into this vision. What is keeping us from this and what must we do to change? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne.
get off screen share here. Very good, thank you. I'd uh, now like to in introduce um, uh, Wilhelmus, uh, goes by Pim, Pim Valkenberg. Uh, he has the uh, uh, interesting title of being ordinary professor, but I like to think of Pim as the extraordinary professor of religion and culture at Catholic University of America, a specialist in Christian Muslim uh, dialogue and studies and in comparative theology. Um, again, please see his full bio in the uh, materials. And Pim, uh, we turn the podium over to you. Thank you very much, Larry. And um, let me start by sharing with you a very small um, slideshow uh, without nice pictures or whatever, just with words. After all, I'm one of these professors that uh, still believes that uh, the words are um, let's say, um, important in um, transmitting knowledge. Okay, so I am, uh, I'm happy and, and very delighted uh, uh, to be part of this. And uh, I would um, like to talk a bit about the issue of dialogue and difference. Um, I um, do think that uh, one of the um, problematic aspects of the term dialogue is that it is often seen as an instrument to come to an agreement. So if you ask people, what do you think about interreligious dialogue? They will usually say, well, that's when we have a bunch of official people sitting together in a room and in the end, they come up with a statement. That's what dialogue is. So I would like to, um, to talk about um, situations in which an agreement is not possible or not maybe even desirable. Um, and I will give you two examples uh, and then I will tell a bit more about what I see as dialogue. Um, the first example is a, um, and I do remember that Anne brought that up in one of our meetings. So I, I thought it, it would be a good way to start. Um, in the dialogue between Christians and Buddhists, um, there is a, situation that often comes back. Uh, I've witnessed it a couple of times. People have written about it, namely that Christians um, in situations of oppression, in situations of suffering, have the tendency to try to end the suffering in part by going after the person who causes the oppression or the suffering. So, um, and I've, I've uh, given you the term here that uh, John McCransky, by the way, a scholar at Boston College who, uh, who is a ordained Tibetan Lama, uh, he, he talks about this idea of the Christian interpretation as the hermeneutical privilege of the oppressed, which basically means that as a Christian, um, we believe that God sides with those who are the least among us, which means that God is not indifferent in a situation of oppression, but God sides with the oppressed. God sides with those who suffer. Um, Buddhists in that same situation would say, okay, we see where you are coming from, but we also think that you choose the wrong ends, the, the wrong means to end your oppression. So becoming angry trying to get to the oppressor does not do justice at the situation that we are all in. So in general, Buddhists would say it doesn't make too much sense to be angry to those who have caused oppression. You should have compassion for all. And that would include not only those who suffer, but also those who cause the suffering. And this has been, let's say, in, in a number of political uh, movements a, a source of unrest between Buddhists and Christians because they they really have the feeling that the other gets the wrong emphasis and um, I know people like uh, Paul Nitter for instance who has written this 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 famous and, and excellent book uh, without the Buddhist Buddha, I cannot be a Christian. He has tried to, to sample out how you can try to do justice to both sides, but it's still very difficult. Okay, let me go to a second example, this time from the Christian Muslim dialogue. Um, 
you may know about this common word document published in 2007 that was a kind of a Muslim interpretation of the relationship between Muslims and Christians and Jews, I should add. Um, they come up with this idea of loving God and neighbor as kind of a common ground, common word, uh, as the text from the Quran, from the third surah of the Quran says. Um, and the idea is, if we can concentrate on these two commandments, the double commandment that Jesus in the New Testament also mentioned, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself, wouldn't that be a way for the three religions to find a common core? Now, in the history of the reception of that common word document, it turns out that some Christians are really enthusiastic about it and say, yes, of course, this is what Christians, Jews and Muslims should do together. But there are other Christians who say, well, we have a couple of problems here. And one of the problems that they almost always mention is the Trinity. Um, loving God, are we really loving the same God? Are we addressing the same God in our prayers or not? That's how it is often phrased. Um, and you can imagine how the way in which Muslims and Christians think about Jesus Christ, whether he is the son of God, God incarnate, yes or no, is a stumbling block in dialogue between Christians and Muslims. And of course, it's also a stumbling block in other dialogues, but I'm concentrating on the dialogue with Muslims now. Now, one of the main standing dialogues is the Building Bridges Dialogue that has been started by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, one of his successors, Roman Williams, uh, famously said, the goal of this dialogue is not to agree, but it is to improve the quality of our disagreements. So if as Christians and Muslims, you know that you will not agree on who Jesus Christ is, that you will not agree on who exactly the God is that you address in prayer. And I should add to this that I personally do think that Muslims and Christians together worship one God. And I also think that my church authority, the Catholic Church in Nostra Aetate has told that quite clearly, but there are still differences of interpretation. And I'm still convinced that when Muslims and Christians talk about Jesus Christ, they have a lot of differences. So how do you deal with these differences and how do you deal with a situation in which you know in advance that you will not agree? Learning from differences, I think, is really the most difficult thing there is because we have never learned how to do that. So um, let me uh, try, and I will in this bre breakout session, try to work with the hypothesis. Um, and the hypothesis is, and uh, you see it here on the third slide, real dialogue uh, is not just have a nice conversation with a cup of tea, but it is an attempt to regain orientation by sustained reflection. And I agree, this is of course a lot of difficult words. That's probably why I thought, okay, let me put on a slide here. So if you talk about the origins of the term dialogue, where does it come from? It, it has, in my opinion, two sources. One is in Greek playwright and also philosophy. So it is a literary genre. It is a way of writing plays. It is a way of writing philosophy. And then the second um, uh, source of this notion of dialogue is in the Jewish tradition, in the Talmud. And then later on, of course, Martin Buber and later Jewish philosophers have, have made this quite famous. The point that I want to make here is that this idea of dialogue as in the Greek dia, dia legain, to, to talk through this idea of through. What does this through mean, this dia? It means that you need to go through a difficulty and to think again, to regain orientation in order to let it work. So my idea about dialogue is, and in fact, I believe it was on the previous slide. So let me go back for a second. Um, 
dialogue happens in situations in which we encounter real differences in such a way that we cannot immediately process it in our usual mindset. So when we encounter a form of difference that makes it necessary for us to pause and to rethink that's in my opinion where real dialogue happens. So in the breakout session I will use a, a third example this time from Christian Jewish dialogues and I will talk a bit more about a, a trip that we made with a number of clergy uh, from Maryland Jewish and Christian clergy to Israel and a conversation that we had with a, a general uh, from the armed forces in Israel about building walls and how important that was to protect the land and to protect the security of the Israeli people. Now, of course, you can imagine this is a topic that has all kinds of political implications. And for me, it was a topic that gave me the impression I need a couple of days to understand better and therefore it is important to be in Israel and the Palestinian territories, but this was in Israel or in Palestina, as I would say with the Catholic Church. Um, it is important to talk, but the more you talk sometimes, the better you become aware that you will not agree. So how do you deal with that? Keeping the talk on, maybe becoming even better friends, but also being aware that you're not agree. I think that's a real big challenge in dialogue and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Valkenberg. Um, we move now to the final panelist. Um, we will be hearing from uh, Ibrahim Anli. Uh, Ibrahim is the uh, executive director of the Rumi Forum. Uh, he has uh, extensive uh, international experience in interfaith dialogue, and uh, he um, has um, continued many of those international relationships over time. So, um, Ibrahim, I turn the podium over to you. Thank you, Larry. So, interfaith dialogue in, could be formulated and contextualized in, in a variety of formulas, uh, but one of them well could be a journey that takes us from the, the notion of tolerance into a better, higher, and more nuanced notion of pluralism. And that is a journey in itself that requires a certain level of commitment, concentration, uh, leadership and, and energy. And there are certain, based on my observation, there are certain distinguishably characteristic phases in that journey. So what I suggest would be too ambitious to call a model that would uh, encompass all interfaith dialogue experience, but I assume that these phases have been observed and experienced and are being experienced by, by many of the participants. So these are recognizable patterns in different co contexts. This framework is based on the assumption that each phase ends with a certain threshold where certain special effort needed is to go beyond. And uh, I highlight key drivers of success from moving beyond one threshold to the other as civility, goodwill, and leadership. So the first phase typically uh, in many interfaith encounters is introduction phase. This is characterized by a high level of curiosity on all sides and a modest level of knowledge about the other group and a cautious, if not ceremonial form of engagement. So, we are really looking at a very 101 kind of uh, encounter here. And the primary outcomes of this introduction phase are ideally rapport and the shared desire to engage in further dialogue based on commonalities. So this, the, the positives and optimistic uh, readings, optimistic un understandings dominate this introduction phase where groups meet. 
a second phase that we might this, um, witness very frequently is the discovery phase where differences and disagreements start surfacing. It is likely that the groups will be unprepared for such uncomfortable discoveries. So there are discoveries and uh, uh, many times they are not easy to comprehend or uh, they are not easy to uh, accept or digest. And they, are un they might be called unprepared and fall short of managing them. So that's a possibility that we need to be ready for. Religious literacy and cultural awareness are invaluable tools to navigate the challenges that shape the discovery phase. So we have homework in a nutshell. This um, ceremonial phase is, uh, cannot be sustained and it cannot be fruitful as it continues to be a, a ceremonial phase. A successful discovery phase will reward parties with an understanding that access to ultimate truth is an experience rather than a monopoly. So there is a lot of uh, unlearning before we can learn that um, very, before we can get to learn that very perspective. It is such an understanding that will lead parties into a conversation that will result in transformation. So after introduction and discovery, the third phase is the conversation phase, where the parties having gone through the first two phases engage in more nuanced exchanges. Possible topics of discussion include, but are not limited to creed, worship, life cycle, experiences, sacred texts, or even politics. So this phase features a series of intercommunal contact, in-depth exchange on religious resources and an elevated role for leaders because it's a risky terrain of issues. The primary outcome of the conversation phase is transformation to a sustained relationship despite differences. So ideally a, a well-managed fruitful conversation phase ends with a solid learning a solid understanding that differences notwithstanding, this can continue. And dialogue is for dialogue. Its outcome is dialogue itself. And lastly, there is the engagement phase that's intercommunal in its form, but it is social in its outcomes. So, uh, it is the level where parties to dialogue are developing shared positions and collaborating on a variety of areas that are not directly related to their identity. So it's not a bicommunal issue maybe they are talking about. It might be about housing or, uh, or drug or any other social problems. So that's what I mean when I say it is social in its outcomes. This is the phase when a common third agenda surpasses all self-concerns of each party and drives them into the civic space as collaborating stakeholders. The primary outcome of engagement phase is a consolidated relationship accompanied with genuine contributions to social justice, environment, and education, and many other issues that, that come across as we have no shortage of those uh, challenges. So in the overall, the phases connect dots of a mental transformation from tolerance to pluralism. Here, I would like to quote Harvard scholar, Diane Eck. She says, Where, while tolerance allows people to stay in their isolated bubbles, pluralism encourages sincere social interaction and building of authentic relationships across perceived religious divides. So those elements of pluralism, those pillars are energetic engagement with religious diversity, actively seeking an understanding of the practices and beliefs of the other, encounter of commitments and continued dialogue. So I would like to uh, continue 
this reflection during the breakout session. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Ibrahim Ali, for uh, sharing the life cycle of, of dialogue, uh, moving very purposefully towards greater uh, pluralism. We have an opportunity now for um, open question and answer according to chat submissions. Um, we uh, welcome uh, further comments uh, as we um, begin to share uh, some initial um, uh, conversation in the uh, chat box and turning some of it into uh, questions. The uh, one question that I do see um, is the affirmation from a participant that um, each of our faiths and faith traditions has uh, some rule uh, that refers to loving others. It's something that uh, Anne uh, Delory referred to um, about uh, loving self and loving others. Uh, and the participants suggest that behind this uh, claim is uh, an affirmation of, of goodness and the goodness of human beings. The uh, question then came from another participant. Uh, how can faith traditions that believe in this um, the dignity uh, of human beings, uh, the goodness of human beings, their worth, how can the faiths together engage uh, contemporary economics and the structures of capitalism, global capitalism, that uh, doesn't always seem to respect the worth of each person? And this is an open question. I'm gonna invite uh, Dr. Goins to uh, maybe uh, respond initially and then any others who would like. Is that all right, uh, Beverly? If we can get Beverly unmuted, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I suppose with regard to, um, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, with regard to um, our faith and um, interfaith relations and how capitalism prevents um, us living out our faith, um, is, That's a good is that, way to put it. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess my response to that um, would be still trying to find ways to um, live out our faith, even in the midst of the, the challenges that are present in our society, that being even capitalism. A lot of, and I'm a, a Christian, um, Protestant, if you want to get to a Black woman um, in this socio-cultural milieu of the, you know, urban, you know, Washington environment, you know, all these different things um, define who I am and my response to um, the challenge that my, um, religion faces. But in doing doing so, tr trying to find that um, hermeneutic uh, interpretation of scripture to apply to how I live my life, you know, I still look back to scripture and how um, Jesus um, engaged the, the problems that he encountered, you know, similar to the um, persecution that we find coming from government for those who didn't have, you know, how are we supposed to live? And um, and even how Jesus combated the the traditionalists of his age, you know, those who said that you um, are supposed to accept and live a certain way, but how he still sought to to fight and to combat and to seek a better way of living for those um, who were marginalized. So I think that even in the face of, of capitalism and all the disparities that we see among um, people in terms of healthcare, in terms of a living wage, 
um, in terms of racism and discrimination, that we still have to call out those injustices. Uh, we can't be silent, um, even as we live in the midst of these oppressive systems. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, all it says to me is that we have work to do and a lot of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Larry. Um, yeah, Larry, sorry, please. May I just, may I just add a thought? Um, yes. I, I don't, I'm not sure that the problem is capitalism. I think the problem is human beings. Uh, if you lay out capitalism, let's say, and socialism on paper, I think it would be fair to say that capitalism in theory seems to be more built on one group having it over another group, whereas socialism is built in theory on everybody being on an even playing field. The fact of the matter is we have yet to see a nation that has proclaimed itself socialist or communist, if I, I don't want to split that hair, where it's worked out that way. And the reason is because, you know, you get Stalin in power and suddenly you've got an autocrat and socialism is not socialist or communism is not communist, even if you call it that. Conversely, you can have a, a capitalist who operates ac uh, according to the principle, it's all about me and what I need and what I want. But you can also have a capitalist who operates an entity, a point, the point and purpose of which is for him or her or them to make a profit, but without discounting the value and the, the, the needs of those who enable that process to, to transpire. I have as a grad student at Georgetown, someone who was, he's now, I guess he's 50-ish. He's actually Chinese American. So he's an immigrant here. He did very well for himself. As soon as COVID hit, he completely redirected his company to make it possible not only to help those who needed help, but he was in touch with me specifically. He said, look, do you know any students who really need help right now that I can help out? And I kind of found out among my students who was really needful. So here's a capitalist, obviously, but he's someone who, I don't even know what his religion is. Let's suppose he is Christian. He's acting out Christianity. He's acting out uh, Caritas, or were he Jewish? He's acting out Tzedakah. He's acting out Zakat, if were he Muslim but you have someone I know, not personally, who, you know, in the course of the millions and tens of millions that that individual has made, has not even shared a tax burden with his fellow Americans. So there are different ways of being a capitalist, just as there are different ways of being a socialist. So I think it's a more fundamental human issue than a, the issue of a particular system. Although I would, I would agree that certain systems would seem, at least on paper, to lead in this direction rather than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. My only footnote is look up the province of Kerala in India. Amazing uh, and successful yeah. uh, province uh, that uh, hasn't gone totalitarian yet. So uh, we're grateful for places like that. Um, I want to move to another question, if I may. Is that all right with the panelists? Sure. Um, what role can uh, religious communities, institutions, and persons play in ending religious bigotry, as well as xenophobia and racism? How do we end religious bigotry as well as xenophobia and racism? Um, and given your topic, Anne, would you be willing to start giving that a, a, a stab? Sure. Um, so, one could um, say that the roots of bigotry and xenophobia are uh, fear of other. And um, so a remedy can be to provide opportunities to get to know others in our community. Um, and that is a role that um, interfaith work can play by providing um, things like speakers coming into your community from a different faith tradition and being able to ask questions and, um, you know, just have that 
personal encounter with other is I think the beginning of um, melting away some of the stereotypes and fears that we might have. Um, so I, I'll, let me let me just leave it at that and see if anybody else wants to elaborate on that. Um, would uh, another panelist like to respond? How do we uh, take on religious bigotry as well as uh, xenophobia, racism together? Uh, if, if I may, just a few words. Education, I guess, is the most important. Uh, and of course, I think it's, it's quite significant that many organizations that are working uh, in interfaith work, like for instance, Rumi Forum, uh, you know, I've had a longer history with Rumi Forum, but education is really the primary tool to get to better relationships. And, and then of course I should add, on the one hand, it, it, education is nice, but then the second step would be to take care that um, what you have been taught and what you have said as churches, as religious communities gets to the people who are sitting in the pews or who are living in the streets. And that of course is, let's say, social action. So I would say education and social action, these two. Very good. We, yeah, uh, um, um, yes, someone else? Yeah, I, I would highlight two things, one more introvert and the other more extrovert. The first one would be, uh, was highlighted kind of earlier, but, um, um, taking further risks in terms of uh, leading, leading the communities to, to really person-to-person -person encounters with, um, <clears throat> with others. We, we, know, we don't know clearly where the gift, the reward uh, is, but it's pretty much clear that it is not in the comfort zones. So if we are not where we would love to be, then there needs to be some new research, some new quest. So, and the, the other thing is more, um, um, the other thing is studies on, on um, Muslim world at least show that uh, part of people being vulnerable to extreme ideas was because of what some call theological deprivation. So religion does have this power but there has been a lack in the chain of communication to communicate religions, um, guidance, moderating power to give meaning to, to people so that they will not be vulnerable to those ideas. So this, uh, if there is any theological deprivation, then that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions uh, from Dr. Goins, um, and uh, we have uh, really ab about um, uh, six, six or so minutes left. Um, so, uh, Beverly, I would like to invite you to share a question. Sure. Um, hmm. I'll start with, um, how do you reconcile freedom of conscience and freedom of religion or religious liberty with religious pluralism when the belief that uh, one person in interfaith dialogue uh, might conflict with the civil rights of another person engaged in the same interfaith dialogue. Can I try my hand at that one, Larry? Yes. <laughs> um, humility. Uh, if we're talking about religion, then to repeat something I said earlier, um, we have to recognize that we're dealing with a realm that none of us has encountered the way we believe someone like Moses or Muhammad has, much less Jesus. Um, so in all humility, I have to acknowledge that I don't know. So my path to repeat may be fine for me. I'm very comfortable with it. But for me to presume that my path is the right path for you is just that, presumptuous. It's my ego speaking. It's not my God speaking. And if I add another layer to that, then in exercising my freedom to express myself, and this could be across a number of 
areas and not even only religion, when we talk about free speech, um, one of the things that I've noticed, particularly in the COVID era, which I guess I've noticed before, is how Americans in particular have this misconception about what the word freedom means. Freedom does not mean that I'm free to do whatever I want or to say whatever I want. I have to stop at a red light so I don't create an accident. So I have to wear a mask so I don't get other people sick. That's not abrogating my freedom. And I can't say whatever I want. I can't call you some insulting name because I, I, why is it bothering you that I'm calling you that? Because that's not my right. That's not what freedom is about. Freedom is about being part of a community, however large, however small, however small, however large, in which by definition, our freedoms are slightly abrogated by the recognition of other people's freedoms, which also comes back to my humility. I don't know it all. I don't have it all figured out. So I've got to step back a little bit and think before I speak or before I act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this relates closely to one question about the tension between freedom of speech on one hand and freedom of religion. By intention it did. <laughs> I didn't know if you'd get to it. Thank you. Uh, yes, and when freedom of speech turns into uh, hate speech. So I appreciate that very much from one of our participants. Uh, Beverly, do you have one more question you'd like to share? Um, yes. In listening to um, uh, Pim, uh, when he spoke about... Um, the, the differences uh, that we come to in our faiths, you know, real differences where you just have to um, be okay with that difference. And um, in um, uh, Ori also, when he talked about um, dialogue and knowing about our own traditions and being aware of its limits, with those things in mind, um, I guess the, the, the question that I'm asking is the difference between um, orthopraxis and um, orthodoxy. Um, where's the starting point? Because it seems that um, maybe some of our panelists are suggesting that you start with um, orthodoxy or understanding right belief. But with um, secular efforts that are going on in, in our society that allow people from different religions to participate in movements like Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement that are seemingly making these uh, great strides in social justice efforts in eradicating white supremacy and stopping acts of violence against Black people and working for equality in the criminal justice sim system and eliminating sexual violence. I guess so my question is, are religious or interfaith organizations needed to do the same work? Um, and I ask this question because manifestations of some religions perpetuate or cover up the very things that these social justice movements like BLM and Me Too are seeking to fight against. Just to get us started, if I may, um, I don't think religious movements and, and institutions are necessary for that. I do think that exactly because religion is often the problem, it is very important that they are part of it. Um, I also think, and, and that's the beginning of your question, uh, Beverly, um, it doesn't begin with orthodoxy, not even with orthopraxy, it begins with living together. So where people are living together, and I do remember there was also a question, how do you begin these processes? I think, well, seek someone, if, if you are not living with, let's say, neighbors who are different from you, and I guess most of us are nowadays living with neighbors who are different in many different ways. So I would say begin with your neighbors. And if you think all my neighbors are the same, well, try to seek out neighbors and often local communities, whether it's church communities or let's say organizations, political or social, they will help you to find people who are different and that's where it starts. Thank you, thank you very much. We are um, at time. Uh, there's one question uh, in the air that maybe uh, some of the small groups might want to address that's related to this very question, and that is with the, the uh, rise in activism that's taken place engaging all kinds of faith communities in the, the recent months. 
how can this activism itself fold back into and transform dialogue? I think it's an excellent question. Um, and uh, faith-based community organizing, for example, I've always wanted them to have a dialogue section uh, in relationship to their activism to have this fold back and this, this uh, impact on, on the way dialogue is done. But it is time for us to move on. Uh, we need to uh, shift into uh, our small groups at this point and you, uh, participants will all be unmuted in the small groups. Uh, I'm gonna invite Cooper to come on and share uh, what the process is like to move into our uh, workout, our, work, our workshop sessions. Hello everyone, it's Kubra from Rumi Form. I'm the program director and also trying to be the tech guy behind the scenes. <laughs> Iwan has been a great help behind the scenes. So um, we have uh, pre-assigned everyone to the breakout rooms, uh, mostly trying to assign everyone to their first choices. Uh, once I open all the rooms, you guys should be automatically moved into your assigned breakout rooms. Um, when there is one minute countdown, um, you will all come back to the main room. Um, I will allow everyone to unmute themselves and I'm doing it actually right now. I did. Um, so have fun in your breakout rooms. Can I assign everyone, uh, Larry? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So on a count of three. <laughs> I am really excited. Uh, one, two, three. I think you all are uh, invited to join the breakout rooms right now. Yes. Uh, in just a moment, ask for each small group to share uh, some highlights uh, of your group for about four uh, minutes or so, um, uh, 45 minutes max, and um, um, try to hone in on um, the uh, kind of moving major major takeaways and uh, if there are any implications for next steps uh, that people can pick up on their own or um, together, uh, please share that uh, as well. Um, I will invite the entire group during this session to share any resources that you may have in terms of websites, um, uh, links to uh, organizations or just names of organizations that you have found helpful in deepening interfaith dialogue. And uh, if there are any upcoming events that you would like people to know about, just share a link um, with that as well. What we can do is take all of these um, links and resource suggestions and send it out back to you in an email so you don't have to be scribbling everything down um, uh, today. Uh, let's hear from, um, let's see, Kubra, what is what is the order of our groups? Um, the order of our groups are, I'm saying, I'll... well, you know what? What I might just do, I'm sorry. Let's just do this. Let's just go in the order um, that we had the panelists uh, speak, if that's all right. So um, um, we'll have the, uh, the group on tackling prejudices with uh, Dr. Soltis, with Ori, um, to uh, begin. And uh, our uh, interlocutor, <clears throat> would be uh, Chris. Are you there? Can you unmute yourself? Because he was our note taker, so I think he would be the um, one. I will let him do that in a second. Chris, you should be able to do that. Yep. Okay. Yep. I'm able to do this now. All right. So some major takeaways of our our group. Um, I'm just gonna go from top to bottom. Uh, I haven't had time to synthesize everything. Um, but. Uh, when we speak of interfaith, we should always be aware of uh, the fact that the fact that faiths are more than just the Abrahamic faiths, um, and oftentimes because those are the largest or the the um, the organizations which we are have already um, relationships with, it is oftentimes the starting point, um, and by no means should it be should it end at that you know in in, in that in that group. Um, there's a need to better engage um, across divides, including the non-affiliated. Um, yep. And how to, and then how to better have conversations with sensitive issues and how to be how to be relevant in those in, in issues. Let's see. There are some lessons which we can we 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 can we can use, for example. When we are when we are gathering together, we can ask ourselves whether or not or whether or not we have the right audience in the room, 
whether we are using accessible language that um, rather than language that can that can separate. Um, be aware that politics have an effect in the group, whether 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 the approach is to not mix politics or it is the politics will eventually get involved. Just be aware that the that po every and every person's individual politics will affect how he or she participates within a group, and then and the messenger matters. Messenger, in some sense, mess matters more than the message. Um, let's see. Um, religions. We have to also be aware that when we speak about religions, religions are composed of people, um, and and everybody has their own take on religion, on their own on their own religion. So, when we can we can distinguish between religion and and a person of faith, and rather than saying a religion in per se. Uh, let's see. When we when we when we say advocate in groups, we should under we should see how that word um, uh, like discussion groups or, or 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 advocate advocating groups or action groups. There are different levels of uh, different kinds of uh, um, how do you say of gatherings, and some people may not be ready for one level, a uh, uh, one one type of um, gathering. And we have to see how we can make those who are who want to remain at a discussion or di a dialogue level, if they are willing and wanting, how they can transition towards um, towards being part of an action group. But we can't expect that someone is already just because they're in a di dialogue group that they are ready for action <laughs> or trained for action. Um, Um, there's a there's a there's a deep need also for realization that everyone who comes to whoever who participates are not we are not we, can, we should not assume that everyone is all in the same place. Um, there, people people move because they feel uncomfortable. So how do you nurture that rather than rather than like you know you, you accompany a person in 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 in, the, in their sense of being uncomfortable. Oh yeah, and so if someone wants to be, wants to be an advocate, um, sometimes they may want to, but they're not, they don't know how to. So the, the, the emphasis here is, are we asking the right questions? We, make, we may make assumptions based on limited information and we don't know what people are willing to do when we set preset when we make preset tasks, um, and education itself is is an action. So, uh, but it's an, also an important step. Just because we there's a separation of church and state, we also stand up for our um, we stand up and be present to the situations that are going on. Um, and being there to witness, to experience is a way of self-educating and trying to understand each other without the assumption that we agree with each other and being respectful with each other. And those are the major takeaways. I hope it was okay. That was great, Christopher. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to uh, uh, Beverly Goins to take the report from uh, the second group, from Anne's group. Sure. Um, Anne's group, which was living faithfully in a racialized society, was actually uh, the group that I was a part of. Uh, we did have someone who was uh, taking notes in that group and who is uh, ready to share. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. So um, to this issue of living faithfully in our racialized society, we started out um, actually with the question of uh, and posed a question of uh, one of our uh, part, uh, panel uh, session peers, uh, Judy, and the question was, uh, how do you how do you engage uh, in a group that lacks diversity? Um, 
And so we started out actually addressing this issue on practical, um, uh, with practical um, responses. And so one of the, uh, one of the suggestions was, uh, or experiences actually, um, was from Anna who uh, provided that, and duly noted that with regards to racism, it's not, race is not an issue of politics and and she she noted that we have politicized the issue of race especially in today's um and in and i believe probably likely to in this country but especially in today's time that we have highly polarized this issue of race and she noted that it is not a uh a issue of race it's a human rights issue and as a human rights issue that there is no left or right um that it is to be addressed in whole and the and so we had a discussion about that. Um, we also uh, Anne also brought up with regards to how do you do this in a, in in congregations or in uh, in faith communities where there is maybe a predominant race, so to speak, um, or a particular lack of diversity. And so um, one of the uh, I made a couple of suggestions. And I think just to generalize, it deals with how we, when we are inviting other people in, how do we label those relationships? So one of the issues or one of the solutions may be going out into communities um, that are different um, and, and fostering those relationships, bringing them back in as visitors, possibly in way of pilgrimage. Um, the, um, Natalie brought up her experience um, being a um, uh, practicing Islam as Muslim and noting that with regards to this, this issue of engagement, community engagement in interfaith perspective, that there is a difficulty in having discussions and in engaging others in other faiths um, that is difficult to foster um, so that in a, a, a experience that she shared, she said that, you know, it, it's one thing to, to try to address people and to share your culture and your ideas and your religions with them, but when they already have a preconceived notion of what your faith is about, that's a problem. And I think that's a very fair point because I do think that we come into in our own engagements, having a certain context about who we are going to engage. So what can we do and how can we address that? Um, and it may, it seems like from our conversations, it may be this whole notion of engaging racially, having these discussions and, and, and bringing them from the outside and bringing them in um, through means of, for instance, um, food sharing, fellowship through food sharing, um, and, and other things. Obviously, there has been a challenge, and that was addressed in our group, that the challenges, the issues that were not existing pre-COVID, where you could engage people, where you could speak to them, where you can break bread, um, and that breaks down the walls of racism, um, that with COVID, that is a greater, a greater challenge. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? One of the things that Anna brought out, um, what she experienced actually is that yes, that this is a challenge to engage personally together to start breaking down these walls, but you can, but that COVID also too, there may be opportunities in COVID that we need to pay attention to. And so for instance, she shared that with COVID, even though there, the, there's this lack of physical um, physical connection, but with re, with the virtual technologies that we're using, it has allowed an expansion and, uh, and actually opened the doors up to a greater um, exposure of people to um, her group specifically. And so maybe that's how we, we also begin. So use the environment that we have and that we've been given, even if it looks challenging, to, to look at the opportunities within that uh, challenge, so to speak, um, and to see how we can foster relationship through those means, and then to um, bring about um, the goals that we're trying to to, to accomplish. Finally, um, 
uh, we we were brought back on track by Joe Lee and uh, Brother Christopher um, to to kind of focus on whether there was this way that we could build a a particular uh, type of uh, curriculum to engage in uh, interfaith on issues of race. Um, and so one of the questions that Anne addressed to Eric was, is there, because he's in a interracial late relationship is, are there any themes that we really need to consider when we're talking about race um, that um, would kind of be on the top of the list of, of this curriculum? So uh, two points that I, I was able to write down um, were the idea of oneness and the fundamental, the, the, that we're fundamentally human. And so also to at the top is to realize that racism is a spiritual disease. And so that's how we would address it in this curriculum is racism is a spiritual disease with an idea towards oneness and fundamental, the fundamental understanding of human beings. Um, that we're all human beings. And to that point, um, Nazalie, towards the end of our discussion, um, I would like to note, brought out that it's not just about trying to fun, find and recognize our commonalities, but also to appreciate our diversity and our differences because that is a part of the plan, of God's plan to bring us together. To, is for us to be able to learn about each other's differences, to be able to appreciate and value those differences. And finally, um, as uh, Brother Christopher brought out, there are tools out there, there are materials out there where we can begin to build a, a, a curriculum for addressing uh, or tackling racism in the interfaith uh, uh, perspective or context. And that um, with those materials, um, we would essentially be learning and unlearning, which is what Nasley said, learning and unlearning some of this deprogramming of these stereotypes, context, um, and mischaracterizations, misinterpretations that we have of each other and each other's culture. And ultimately, towards the end, we all basically um, came down to this notion and understanding, cohesive understanding, is that um, what Anna said is that we don't, we realize we don't know <laughs> as much of anything at all. And so if, when we come to the table understanding that we don't know everything about ourselves, which is what one of the presenters um, brought forth at the beginning of this um, conference, if we come to the table with that humility of understanding that we don't know everything with ourselves and with each other, then that's how we begin. And then as uh, uh, Beverly um, nicely rounded out our discussion with the reminder that sometimes we have to work on ourselves and work on our inter uh, work on ourselves and our, on our personal selves before we can even begin to to engage in racial discussions that this has to be uh, like certain things like writing our journals what are we doing to personally unpack the implicit biases that we have within ourselves, holding ourselves possibly accountable for those, and then taking those means and bringing those to the table so that when we get we begin these discussions with our curriculum of materials, and with this this one this this desire towards a oneness and understanding, appreciating commonalities and differences, um, that we can begin to start to to bridge the divide. Um, of race and have a uh, contextual discussion in interfaith. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Angela. Uh, very thorough um, um, highlights of, of that, that um, discussion. Um, I will now take um, the report from um, the group that dealed with uh, learning from difference. This is PIM's uh, group. Um, you can unmute yourself.
if you oh, Pam, yeah. are you um there you go. I am now unmuted. Sorry, yeah. I got a message that I could not unmute myself. Um, so Rada will be the person who um, gives the report from our group. I, I should probably add just in one sentence, we had less of a discussion, more of an exchange of, of personal stories. Yeah, thank you, Kopra, for, I, I, I muted. You hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, we can. Do it. Yeah, our our session, as uh, Dr. Valkenberg has just mentioned, it was more about sharing about experience. Uh, we have at the beginning uh, introduction or introducing ourselves, uh, and most of the members they are interested in uh, dialogue and interface dialogue and learning about the other. And uh, after that, uh, the session started with um, a question by Dr. Valkenberg, uh, for which he gave us like one minute to think about, about moments uh, or experiences that changed the way that we look at a human being and we learn from the differences. And is there actually like on, in real life possibility to learn from differences? And uh, Dr. Valkenberg started by sharing his experience uh, uh, when he has a, tr a trip to Israel, uh, it was with the, the Maryland the Clergy Initiative in 2010. And uh, he, the, uh, the lesson or the moral of his experience, it's, uh, it was like the, uh, the group consists of Christians and uh, Jewish people, and they have uh, 20 rabbi and Christian clergy who study together during this trip and the point that Dr. Valkenberg has highlighted that Christians think about the land as a metaphor in the New Testament and the Jews think about the land as like important physical place and uh, during that journey like when uh, when Dr. Valkenberg was in Tabcha which is where the Christ pronounced the sermon on the mount uh, he he wrote uh, uh, he read uh, something written on the um, in a Catholic church there, like you know, uh, placed are the people who will inherit the land. And at that moment, uh, he discovered like you know, uh, he he came he came uh, for dialogue and for maybe learning about the similarities. But at that moment, he he was more convinced about his disagreement about how others look and about his position or his belief. And then the challenge, the, the real challenge is how to, to make better relationship or better friends. And still you are convinced and you are like, uh, let's say very solid about your disagreement with the other. And then I think we have uh, also like sharing uh, a story by Tonya, if I am correctly pronouncing the name. And she, she was, uh, I, I like the questions she, uh, she proposed, like how people deal with their religious knowledge uh, in, um, during this time, especially the pandemic how we have like, you know, this religious experience and now we have these present questions and people asking and about the existence of God or how God or why God would allow such an evil and all these questions. And now sometimes you are in a comfortable zone with your religious experience and now you are challenged, challenged by, you know, new experiences and new questions. And then also we have Patrick who, uh, who, who also highlighted this uh, issue about thinking about the faith during the pandemic and how one can evaluate uh, his faith with experience and does your, your faith and your, your religious knowledge change with experience and with time and during difficult you know, situations and uh, and then what is the religious basis to to adapt and to deal with these difficult situations and maybe difficult uh, different reactions from people even from the same faith 
and from different faiths. And I, I just share something about my, uh, my experience uh, and being uh, uh, confronted with uh, different, you know, uh, communities being uh, majority with minority and now minority with majority on the individual and how this diversity of experience uh, has given me as a source of en enrichment. So the more you have experience and you encounter with people who are different from you, uh, I think the more you will have knowledge, the more humility you get. So this is, it means we have to encounter the other who is different uh, because this will give us a chance to be able more to adapt and accommodate ourselves to the differences of the others still we uh, at the so same moment to respect them and to treat them in a in a human way or uh, to look at them with like you know respect and then we have uh, participation or mehmed uh, he shared uh, his experience about like when he came to the us and the challenge to invite his friends because you know he was in Turkey and then he came to the US. Now, when you change from one place to another place, what are the challenges and how you convince people to uh, interact and from being, let's say, from being exclusive to being inclusive and to adapt to this plural uh, society and how uh, we can reach a point not only to talk about similarities, but also to, to talk about uh, differences and to learn from these differences. And the last sharing was by Mariam, but unfortunately the session was <laughs> out before she um, completed uh, her participation. But anyhow, like just I was able to take some notes that uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's very important to improve uh, the space of our disagreement while keeping a good relation and uh, le living peacefully with the other. And I think the main uh, issue uh, it revolve or the main theme of our session was uh, to uh, to have the courage to 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 encounter that you know, the differences and not only to encounter the differences, but to, to have this as a chance to learn from these differences and to grow as a human being and, you know, contribute to our community and the society and the world as a whole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gada. Um, Let's move then, uh, Beverly, do you wanna take the last uh, report from uh, Ibrahim's group? Yeah. Sure. Um, Ibrahim's group uh, explored the life cycle of dialogue. Um, and we would love to hear from your person and your group who took notes. Yeah, um, thank you. And uh, Colleen was, uh, uh, was taking notes during the um, during the discussions, and uh, she'll summarize key outputs and uh, key insights. Colleen, please. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so first, we kind of um, just gathered why we were interested in this workshop. So um, some of the answers from the different partic participants were um, how we can actually do things together as different faiths. How do we move from dialogue to action? How do we form friendships in dialogue? Some of us were also interested in dialogue as a concept itself. And then um, others of us had spent time before in ecumenical or interfaith efforts and wanted to deepen our knowledge. So from gathering our um, kind of interests about joining this workshop, we moved to a period of discussion and sharing of experiences. So first, um, Ibrahim posed to the group what our, what our experiences about um, the phases of dialogue have been, what inputs or capacities are needed to move from one phase of dialogue to the other, and then what are our reflections on the model presented as tolerance um, to pluralism? And so first, um, Jim, one of our participants, 
he shared that um, one of the experiences that's, that he, he has had is that he has encountered friction in over, overcoming emotional barriers um, as we move through dis the discussion. So it's not primarily an intellectual pro problem, but an emotional problem. Um, so how he presented a question to the group from that saying, how can we help people move forward in presenting intellectual information, but those people um, have emotional boundaries. And um, Kate, another participant added that another barrier to um, basically productive dialogue is people's environments. So taking people out of the environments that maybe make them less open or um, make them less um, conducive to dialogue. Um, and then Jim replied that, you know, there's such an importance of finding the right environments and also the right time, um, whether that's a time in the year or a certain liturgical time or um, feast time or celebration time um, for different faiths to have dialogue and friendship. And um, a few participants had added some best practices that either they've experienced or that they've observed. And um, Mansfield, another participant, had said that what is helpful for him was having people come together towards a common mission. Um, so people of different faiths coming together to resp respond to crises. And then um, Margaret also found that a best practice towards dialogue is doing a spiritual practice together. Um, and involved in that was kind of acknowledging a common core of our faith and then also um, asking each other what it meant to be practicing this um, certain spiritual practice together. And then um, from there, Ibrahim also posed to the group what our own specific observations about getting frustrated, um, moving through the different uh, phases of dialogue and kind of like what was holding us back from moving to those different phases. And um, Abby had shared an experience of um, working in or taking an experience of clinical pastoral education and um, meeting uh, Catholic seminarians and them being not very open um, to dialogue and very much being obsessed with um, certain tenets that um, Abby had different beliefs about. And so Abby posed the question, you know, is was it a healthy thing to just kind of settle on um, let's not talk about this anymore. And so um, she raised that point. Um, and then in my own experience, I talked about um, being a teaching assistant at the Catholic University of America and also just um, kind of some of the people that Abby referred to teaching um, those individuals and kind of circling back to that earlier point of taking people out of homogenous environments in order to open them up to dialogue. And then um, lastly, we... Um, talked about what kind of attitudes are helpful to good environments for dialogue and what is the challenge of making sure that these attitudes are communicated to people in our communities. Um, so Larry actually um, posed that we can bring a practitioner of a different faith or um, tradition to our space. And um, he actually found it more effective if there's a guest from another tradition speaking on behalf of their faith and he's found that people usually are um, more well behaved in front of this person, but can also dialogue in a more um, open fashion with them. And then finally, um, we talked as a group about the value of scriptural reasoning. And this was raised um, by Kate and others in the group as an opportunity um, for openness in a new way and allows for the actual um, sacred text to mediate the conversation. Um, so on the whole, it was a very good conversation. And I think we all learn from each other and our experiences. And um, it just kind of circled back to this, this point that um, Ibrahim made that um, this process of dialogue is um, from tolerance and negative peace to a, one that's uh, pluralism and positive peace. So um, thank you guys. Thank you, Colleen. Um, that was wonderful report. All, all the reports are really wonderful and uh, appreciate the energy and the thoughtfulness that, that went into each one. Um, we uh, are a little bit over time. We really only have about, um, oh, uh, only, only 15 minutes left. Um, I, uh, I didn't know, um, 
I, I think given the time, we're probably going to need to move to uh, final reflections. Um, and if, if anyone does have a question that has gone unanswered, um, just put it in the chat box. And if we can get to it, um, we certainly will. Um, I want to uh, just say a few remarks before I turn it back over to uh, Dr. Goins. Um, some of the, the threads that I heard uh, in uh, the small group reporting, uh, one thread, um, and I liked, I liked the dialogue in action uh, phrase that Colleen used. Um, so I'm gonna try to phrase each, um, each uh, of these threads in, in, with the word dialogue involved. Um, and the, the first one is around barriers. So something about um, uh, dialoguing through barriers might be the right, um, uh, the right term. Um, a number of barriers uh, were shared and, and uh, named, uh, everything from uh, certain topics not to touch uh, because there's uh, understood uh, that that will take much deeper time to uh, explore given the relationship, um, but, and also the process of learning and unlearning uh, that, that is required as we uh, address barriers. Um, dialogue in relationship, um, or for the sake of relationship. This is a huge theme that it was running through um, uh, the presentations earlier and the small groups that um, relationships are some of the most transformative dynamics of uh, ongoing dialogue. And they, um, if you don't start with respect, they, they develop respect. Uh, in other words, if you begin with suspicion or fear, uh, the, building the relationship does, that does build deeper respect for um, different uh, uh, practices and different views. Dialogue and movement or dialogue and growth uh, has been a theme running through. And it, this is part of the theme of, from uh, uh, di you know, dialogue to encounter uh, of the uh, the whole ILF um, uh, theme. Um, and there were a number of, of shared um, strategies for setting the, t the, the tone and the, um, the, the, the best conditions under which dialogue then can, can deepen and, uh, and grow more fully. Uh, everything from uh, being engaged in common work to spiritual practices, um, uh, scriptural reasoning, um, having a common um, uh, crisis to respond to uh, in, in the community or a, a challenge like, like uh, xenophobia or racism. Uh, and then finally, uh, dialogue in action, uh, to, to borrow from the last group's report. Um, uh, the, uh, that takes me back to Beverly's, her own journey about how do we um, address misconceptions, overcome prejudices, um, and then get to the heart of learning about each other that allows us to give some common witness in the public square um, with um, um, a very, very different tone or a very different effectiveness than the, the culture wars model of uh, religious, uh, religious engagement with the public sphere. Those are the four I heard, uh, the four, uh, threads that really stood out to me, dialogue um, through barriers, dialogue in growth, dialogue in relationships, dialogue in action. So uh, Beverly, I'm, I'm interested in turning this over to you, if that's all right. Okay, so um, I'm hoping that, you know, what I have to say is not um, extremely redundant. Um, just uh, to recap what I've heard here um, from Ori's group, to be cognizant of the different levels of readiness for engagement that exist in interfaith faith gatherings. Um, so to listen and um, uh, be conscious of how we treat each other and you know where the, what the people in the group are ready to do. In Anne's group, um, it was um, stated that racism is a spiritual disease and that there exists uh, methodologies to break racialized preconceptions that we have of each other and uh, that there are curriculums that can be used to 
you, curriculums to be used and the need to develop more to uh, deprogram um, mischaracterizations of each other as it pertains to race and culture and to facilitate um, bridge building. In uh, Dr. Valkenberg's group, uh, PIM, uh, they exchange personal stories, which is the, the essence of uh, interfaith encounter um, and demonstrated the ability, the importance of learning from uh, our differences. And in Abraham's group, um, they talked about the life cycle of dialogue should move from tolerance to pluralism. And that in that movement, um, we need to be aware of the emotional bandwidth of those who are involved and to be aware of how timing and environment can influence this uh, movement to pluralism and that um, having a common mission and involving each other in spiritual practice helps that uh, life cycle of dialogue uh, move along. Um, in the group that I attended, a Nazali, well, there's this kind of um, dichotomy that exists within interfaith dialogue, where Nazali and the group that I was in said that her faith teaches diversity and difference are a part of God's divine plan. Yet in interfaith dialogue, uh, you still have to have the ability to stand firmly in one's faith um, and one's relationship with God. And you need to know that standing firm in your faith and your relationship with God does not diminish someone else from doing the same. And um, what I learned from listening to this group in particular is that most of us seem to be well past encounter and onto engagement. Um, that we are already engaged in uh, racial and social efforts in the interfaith manner uh, in, the, in the interfaith manner to make positive changes in our society and move toward pluralism and that a lot of the people who are in attendance here are looking for support um, and ideas in furthering their current activities to make themselves and the people uh, with whom they're engaging stronger and um, what I am suggesting is that the ILF, the Interfaith Leadership Forum, is poised and ready to help in these efforts. Uh, once again, I'll restate our objectives, which are to equip one another with models of dialogue, to help us experience deeper levels of interfaith encounter and dialogue, to strengthen literacy of the other's faith and one's own, to help each other overcome prejudices and misconceptions about um, our faith and others, and to elicit social action through interfaith engagement. So um, I'm ready and I hope you are, and I hope that the ILF can be of assistance in moving all of us from um, uh, in engagement, I'm sorry, from encounter to serious interfaith engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Um, Deeply grateful for um, your leadership and deeply grateful to the, all the panelists for um, the thoughtfulness and care by which this event was designed and uh, the workshops uh, and topics were uh, highlighted. Um, I want to uh, just quickly, uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, left before um, the final thank, thank yous. And um, I think if it's, uh, if it's all right, um, the uh, there's a question uh or comment let's see oh well, that's a wonderful comment from richard um let me just ask very quickly uh not not to well two things one please share any events coming up or any organizations that you think are really helpful resources uh this idea of developing a interfaith um anti-racist uh curriculum is really quite uh, remarkable and uh there's some work done out there um but I think uh, moving further with the kind of goals that you had in mind would be would be outstanding. Um, so uh, share any resources that you know of. I do want to ask if anyone is interested in, in helping plan um, future events like this with ILF 
or be involved in uh, discussions about implementing, please um, share it in the chat box or um, just uh, email um, uh, one of the, the leaders. I'll, I'll certainly put my email into the chat box as well uh, if you want to get back to um, any of us. Um, the, uh, the other thing, though, is whether um, we, we did see a hand earlier, and uh, I believe Kubra um, noticed a, a hand. If there's uh, any final um, question that someone did not get to ask, I think we do have a, a few minutes. So let me just ask if, um, if there is a final question. If, if so, just, um, uh, just um, raise a hand or um, uh, let us know in the chat box. Cooper, are we good? Um, okay. Yes, uh, the, uh, the participants are allowed to unmute themselves. Um, so I don't see any hand raising right now, but. Okay. Very good. Um, let me just ask the sponsors uh, if you if you do. Uh, uh, okay, good. Um, I, I noted one event that the consortium has coming up uh, on uh, uh, November the 10th. Um, and it's a Muslim Christian dialogue uh, lecture around peace building. Um, you might find it very interesting. I sent the link out. Um, it's an evening a virtual event. The sponsors have any other announcements they would like to, to make about up, upcoming events. I know IFC has a, a, a big event coming and um, maybe there are others that also want to share something briefly. Yes, hi, this is Anne from the interface. Faith Council and, and uh, we have our annual could be virtually put in the chat. Can you hear okay, me now? Great. No? Yeah, we're having a little little difficulty, but go ahead. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, just to say that our annual interfaith concert is coming up and you can get tickets online at on our website, um, faith traditions come together to um, offer some type of musical or dance performance that is authentic to their tradition. Excellent, well, thank you. Um, announcements from the other sponsors. Um, we we have an upcoming event on sacred spaces where four traditions will be uh, speaking about, representative of four traditions will be speaking about their concepts of the sacred space. So it's already in the chat box. Great, excellent. Thank you. Don't forget, uh, go to these websites, uh, colleagues, and sign up to get newsletters from, from some of these organizations. Um, E-newsletters uh, come out at different times for different groups, but it's good to stay in touch with what's going, going on. Um, and uh, uh, any announcements from the DC mayor's office or from the, uh, the uh, advisory um, council in Montgomery County? Dr. Goliman, this is Reverend Bowen from the mayor's office. Um, there's no announcements that, that we um, have uh, a pending, but this has been a, a wonderful um, um, day. And I thank you for allowing us to be a co-sponsor. Thank you, Reverend Bowen, for uh, bringing your community along to join us. Uh, and we may have lost uh, Casey already. Did uh, any announcements, uh, Casey? Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. I've just posted our uh, website uh, through which you can get into our uh, onto our newsletter list. We have a Excellent. number of events coming up, not specifically an interfaith dialogue. It's part of everything we do, but uh, to save time. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Um, I want to uh, extend thanks. We are at time. Extend thanks to uh, the Rumi Forum uh, and uh, the, uh, the genesis uh, of this idea uh, coming from the Rumi Forum. Uh, thanks to the Washington Theological Consortium. Thanks to the Interfaith uh, Council of Metropolitan Washington. Uh, thanks to the DC Mayor's Office on Interreligious Affairs. And thanks to the Montgomery County Faith Advisory um, Council. Um, 
this is uh, an event that just is a grassroots event. It just uh, uh, no grants, no uh, no uh, um, huge uh, backers. That these are just communities that thought this was important. So they pooled some seed money and made it possible. Um, and we're we're really grateful to uh, all of them. Um, the uh, Final invitation, if you are interested in working on something like the anti-racist curriculum uh, or resource, um, please email me or, um, or email um, Anne uh, Delory at uh, the Interfaith uh, Council. And um, we, would, we would love to explore possibilities um, for doing that. We will send out a final evaluation form so you can evaluate this day and help strengthen it with your uh, recommendations. So that will come to you by email as well. Um, I think we are at time. And uh, again, uh, uh, my deep gratitude to each one of you for being with us today. Um, my, my, my deep sense of inspiration that um, uh, there's, there's commitment, a spark of commitment and, and uh, and dedication for this kind of work um, and, and everyone here. And uh, uh, blessings on that path. And uh, please remember that we would join, love to join you in that path as you uh, explore your next steps. So thank you all. Thank you. Just hands. Thanks to all. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Bye, thank you. It's been wonderful working with you all. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kubra. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining. Great.